will make your way over to John chapter 21. Five more verses. I've been thinking about what to preach, and we preach through every book in the New Testament. And then I got to looking at the Old Testament. We got to Genesis chapter 11 and left off. We got to Ezekiel chapter 4 and left off. We covered all the minor prophets. We had done 1st and 2nd Kings, our 1st and 2nd Chronicles, our Leviticus. We're going to work hard at where we land next. John chapter 21. Beginning in verse 20. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also leaned on his breast at, at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, If I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then the same went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies or gives witnesses of the things, uh, of these things and wrote these things that you might know that his witness or his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you have blessed us with a, a good afternoon for most of us, Lord. And I just appreciate those who showed up tonight, Lord. I thank you for those who were here this morning. Lord, I ask that you would uh, make a uh, an end to this book of John and one that would please you. Lord, I ask that you would watch over us, Lord, as we still have folks in the hospital, Lord, and and, uh, and uh, those kind of things, Lord, people going to the hospital, Lord, people who have been asked for prayer for surgeries on Tuesday. Uh, Lord, we just uh, ask that you would look in on all those things and help me remember them, Lord, so that I may pray for them individually, one by one, Lord. Bless the reading of your word tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There they are by the Galilean seashore. They have had Jesus set a table for them. He has brought them bread. He has shared in their fish. And I didn't cover this, but there were already some fish cooking. So Jesus himself had been out there just to show them that he's an angler. Uh, so we don't say that Jesus didn't like fish, right? So uh, he had some fish cooking and uh, he gave them sustenance and then he goes about the business of restoring Peter. Uh, I think that he does this uh, sitting around that fire. Some people look at that and they say, well, he took Peter off to the side. I say, no, they've eaten and he's sitting there with those other disciples and they're doing it. Uh, the best they can do. You almost made it. Just step forward. Uh, uh, no, that was funny. I'm sorry. Uh, sitting there, and I think about this now. I've said this a couple of weeks ago that uh, that. Public sin needs to be dealt with publicly. Private sin needs to be dealt with privately. And what Peter had done in denying Christ was certainly very public. He dealt it out in front of all those people who were gathered there. He dealt it out in front of Christ himself. Even John, who was probably there in the courtyard somewhere, heard this. And so it was very public. So Jesus restores Peter in a very public way. Now, if you go back into the uh, the back of Luke, you'll see that he'd already come to Peter in, in a private session before this time after his resurrection. He spoke to Peter. A matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that Peter is one that Jesus appeared to uh, by himself. 
Uh, so he he's there and he's talked to Peter, and I'm sure they've got this stuff done, but then he needs to restore Peter uh, in front of these other disciples so these other disciples will be able to uh, say, you know, God's dealt with this issue. Jesus has, has restored him to his proper place in the, in the disciple uh, realm, and uh, we can go on and, and we can get business done. So the Lord does that. And then he, in verse 18, begins to talk about how he would die. How early that morning, while he was on top of that boat, when he recognized it was Jesus, he was able to gird himself, uh, put back on his outer garment, and then swim and, and have freedom of movement to get to Jesus. But there was coming a day when someone, would, when he was older, at the end of this, this run that he had to do for Jesus, uh, that someone would bind his hands and gird him and carry him to a place he didn't want to go. And then Jesus said, you know, between now and then, right, follow me. So, when he says follow him, I, I think that maybe Jesus got up and he began to, to, to take a couple of steps back and Peter gets up with him and, and uh, Peter hears somebody behind him. And he looks around. Now, this is just me. It could be that I was not there, okay? All I know is that Jesus was talking directly to Peter, and Peter took his eyes off Christ one more time and began to worry about somebody else, right? All right, Lord, it's kind of like, it's kind of like if you've ever been to a, a, one of those... Uh, when you were kids and the, and the girls would make them little things and you would do your fingers with a paper and who you marry and what color you like, that kind of You remember those things? I never made one and never got to participate, but I've certainly seen it a lot, right? And it's like, all right, do me, do me next, do me next, do me next. It's kind of like, okay, 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 okay. This is great, this is great, this is some good stuff. I, I'm going to die. Uh, do me. Uh, and looks around and, and sees John. We know this is John. This is a disciple who love. This is a disciple who's leaning on his breast. We know who this is. And Peter seeing him says, Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Do him. What's he going to do between now and then? What's his role? What's he going to play? What's he going to do? And Jesus says to him, if, if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Sometimes I'm reading the Bible and I run across this verse and I've, I've had it yellowed out a long time. It's, it's there. And when I come to this verse, I, I think about other people around me. When I pass by other churches, I, I'm always looking out there and see how many people they had come on Sunday night or Wednesday night. Or, or when I'm listening to uh, other preachers talk, I always, you know, how many people they had in Sunday school that morning or how many people they had uh, saved or baptized. Or, you know, I'm always trying to, to check out the competition, if you will. And uh, I used to be really bad at that and used to really be very envious of that because, you know, some people look like things just fall into life and God just blesses their church with fruit and fruit and fruit and more fruit and much fruit. And, and I, I just get to pick an apple every once in a while. You know, they bring them in by the baskets, loaders, and I'm out there seeing if there's any on the tree <laughs> uh, to pick. And this verse here reminds me, as Jesus was rebuking Peter, he also rebukes me. It's very strongly worded. Cuts Peter off in the quick. It cuts me off in the quick. What business is it of mine what God is doing with his own servants, right? What business is it of mine what God's doing over here or over there or way over yonder or with this family member or what business is it as long as I'm found faithful in doing what I was called to do? As long as I'm feeding lambs and tending sheep and feeding sheep where I've been called, then that's really all I can do. Because it's not up to me to keep score, right? It's not up to me to keep score. God's doing all that. He's seeing that. 
And sometimes it's not the amount of fruit I produce, but the obedience I, I go through to make sure that I'm faithful in trying to produce the fruit. Where's my heart? Am I doing it to beat some other guy on his baptism rate? Am I trying to beat somebody else on the amount of people we had in Sunday school? Right? And is that why we do it? Well, if that's it, then that's going to be some of that wood, stubble, and, and hay works that you find over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in, in verse 10, talking about that's going to be burnt to the ground because that was, that was not done uh, with a heart of love or with a heart of discipleship. Jesus reminds, rebukes Peter, if you will, that uh, nothing else matters other than you being specific and staying close to me and keeping your eyes focused on me. That's, that's what gospel-centered ministry is. That's what Christ-centered church is about. Not being concerned about what everybody else is producing, but what Christ is producing in us and through us. Well, Jesus says this, and then a rumor gets started, verse 23. Then the saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die, right? You remember the old story of the wandering Jew just will not die? Well, this is where this comes from. But John wants to set the record straight. He does not live everybody else. We believe that he was the youngest. We also believe that he ends up being the, the oldest lived of the original apostles. We feel that somewhere around 95 that uh, he's uh, exiled to the island of Patmos and there uh, uh, he gets the, the, the book and ideas and thoughts for the book of, of Revelation and he writes those things down. And uh, he does live to see both Christ's work and Christ's burial and Christ's resurrection and he does get to see Christ in his glory with those heavenly visions that he did. He gets to see all of those things. So John goes back and he says, yet Jesus did not say to him he would not die. He said, if I will that he remain shall I come, what is that to you? He says, you know, this is what he really said. Not that I wouldn't die. Not that the, the word of God wouldn't be false or anything. But he just said, he was just telling Peter, what, what's anything that John's got to do got to do with you? Whatever blessings I bestow on John, whatever business I put in John's way, uh, that has nothing to do with you. You just be faithful and follow me. Then, verse 24, the word testifies, your word may say, your Bible may say, witness is witness is true. And that is a, a, a big focus and key element in the book of John, mentioned something like 43 different times. He wants to make sure that people knew that he was an eyewitness to these accounts. And that you could find him up and look at and he could probably find up some folks who were still around. And they would give testimony that everything was written was written. Look at verse 31 in chapter 20. It says, But these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and uh, uh, the Son of God, and that believing uh, you might have life in his name. Because why? Why were these things written? Well, Verse 30 says, True, Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples which are not written in his book. This is very specific. These are key things that the Spirit of God thought that uh, John should write about, give witness and credibility to, uh, so that when people would read later on, they would have the idea that, yeah, somebody was there, this thing really happened. So John talks about how he testified of these things and and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Again, his witness, he was an eyewitness to this. Not him alone, but also the others that were with him, and all the folks who seen him after the resurrection. People saw this. Verse 25. Probably one of the most condemning verses of Scripture toward the nation of Israel in the whole Bible. You think, well, what a why? John picks out these events, these seven events that he's talked about. Eight if you count the resurrection. And these were enough to go back and, and have those Jewish leaders uh, held accountable for being disobedient to the light that God had given them. Jesus came to the world, came into his own, and they received him up. They were already condemned with the light. With just these seven signs, 
But verse 25 says, And there are also many other things that Jesus did which were written one by one. I suppose that, uh, that even the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. So we have in this gospel something like 37, 38 different miracles that Jesus performed. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, some of them are the same miracles. Uh, those were enough to prove between Matthew and Mark and Luke and John that Jesus was the Christ. Here John writes not only in verse 25 of 21, but also in verse uh, 30 of 20, that Jesus did so much more. So much more divine light. So much more divine ministry that Jesus did that there's no way to, to calculate because when Peter talks about him in the book of Acts, he calls him uh, uh, this man, Jesus Christ, who went about doing good. Where Jesus was, good happened. And miracles took place, one upon the other, and another, and another. And light and light from heaven shined everywhere so that the nation of Israel had no excuse at all to say that this was not Messiah. That this was not the chosen one. That this was not the one who was sent. That this was the one who had always been planned to come. They had no reason, you know, it wasn't just something done over in the corner. It wasn't just these seven isolated events that got everybody stared up. Jesus did things almost on a daily, uh, daily uh, uh, work level. He got up, prayed in the morning, uh, got the guys together, and they went out doing good. And they did good all across from one end of Israel to another end of Israel. They went across the uh, the Galilean Sea and spent a little time in Caesarea Philippi where the land of the, the Gentiles were. Uh, they went through Samaria uh, a couple of times and, and did ministry there. Uh, Jesus was everywhere one fellow could be in three years by walking with a group of people behind him. And wherever he did, he did one miracle after another miracle, stacked on top of another miracle. And yet there is the denial that he came from heaven. Brother Tony, that's one thing. What else does it mean? Well, it means that people can hear about Jesus. People can acknowledge Jesus. And they can still miss Jesus. You think to yourself, well, you know, I've said about all about Jesus I can say to these people. And yet there's so much more to say. And we're called to be lights and not to stop shining light because we got mad because people stopped listening to us. Or we got hurt because people stopped uh, uh, hearing what we had to say or, or seeing what we had to show them. Jesus is so much more than what even our, our Bibles tell us about Him that we can pour even that out into this people's situation. Jesus has never run across the sea and He couldn't forgive. Never run across a problem he couldn't solve. And never put more on us to bear than we could handle. That's Bible. At least the last part for sure. One old evangelist used to say like this. There's much more mercy in Christ than there is sin. And I think that's what John is trying to say to you with that last verse. That I could have said so much more because Christ is so much more. And yet my witness is true and this should be enough if you believe. And then he says that one word there, amen, or so be it, or get in agreement with me. So that's all I've got to say about John. Is that